cannabis is not a federally legal product, but it became an essential item overnight. I was like, wow, from illegal to essential in a month kind of thing. And it exploded e-commerce in this category. There are very few industries that are growing as fast as the cannabis industry, which saw about $20 billion in sales in 2020. With that much potential profit and opportunity all around, getting into the cannabis game is something that a lot of folks are starting to jump into, or at least become curious about. I can think of at least three or four times of guests in the past few months who said they are secretly curious about the cannabis industry in the lightning round at the end of the episode. But as with any industry, there's more to it than just the product itself. Manufacturing, distribution, expansion, and of course, regulation all play a role. Thankfully, Liz Wald has experience in all of these areas and is putting them to use as the chief strategy and digital officer for Good Earth Organics. Liz has a long and impressive history in the digital world, having gotten her start at places like AOL, Etsy, and Indiegogo. On this episode of Up Next in Commerce, she guides us through it all, including the trials and tribulations of turning an e-commerce marketplace such as Etsy into an international player and what other companies can learn from that journey. Plus, she talks about building partnerships, expanding into new markets, the potential of cryptocurrency, and how all of that will happen in the cannabis space. Enjoy this episode. Before we get into the episode, I would love it if you could hit subscribe and give the show a rating and review. I really wanna know what you think and hear how we're doing. All right, on to the interview. Really quick, I want to say thank you, thank you to our awesome sponsor, Salesforce Commerce Cloud. And I'm going to allow them to give you the inside scoop into some of the findings from their most recent State of Commerce report. Hi, this is John from Salesforce. Did you know that companies of all sizes and industries power their digital customer journeys with Commerce Cloud? Salesforce Commerce Cloud delivers B2B and B2C commerce, as well as order management around the globe. And with Commerce Cloud, you can engage with your customers anywhere and personalize interactions everywhere. Scale and innovate with ease and drive some serious growth for your business. And speaking of innovation, we recently surveyed nearly 1,400 commerce leaders and analyzed the consumer shopping and business buying behavior of more than 1 billion customers worldwide. And we uncovered emerging trends that will influence how companies can be successful and stay ahead in this ever-evolving landscape. To check out the trends we discovered, go to sfdc.co slash commerce insights. That's sfdc.co slash commerce insights, one word. Welcome back to Up Next in Commerce. This is your host, Stephanie Postles, CEO at mission.org. Today, we have Liz Wald joining the show, who currently serves as the Chief Strategy and Digital Officer at Good Earth Organics. Liz, welcome. Thanks so much, Stephanie. Great to be here. Same. Yeah, I I wish this was in video format so people could see your background. But for anyone who can't see it, describe it a bit because I think it'll be a good segue and intro into this show. Absolutely. Well, my background is an amazing cannabis plant that is fully crystallized and ready for harvest, full of amazing terpenes, and somebody's going to really enjoy uh, consuming it. (laughs) When I was going through and looking at where you've worked previously, It was really cool to kind of see where your journey has led you through places like Etsy and Indiegogo and now to the cannabis industry. And I wanted to hear a bit about, you know, your background and how you got to where you are now. Sure. Well, you know, I I went to business school at uh, Kellogg at Northwestern and I graduated in 1995. And, you know, a lot of people were going into banking and consulting and whatnot. And, you know, I sort of looked around and I was like, this whole internet thing, it, it seems like it's going to be big, you know, like there's, there's people are going to be shopping and, you know, doing things like that. And so I was also not really interested in going to a big corporate. So I found my way toward, to a small group of people doing consulting to a little company called AOL back when you oh, got mail was a thing, you know, yep. and like we were getting thick magazines with CD-ROMs in them and you had oh a gosh. dial up internet connection, right? Yep. So some of your listeners might have been too young to even uh, know what all that is. But basically that was kind of the beginning of when people were really thinking about whether e-commerce was going to be a legit thing. And at that time, you know, people were like, you'll never buy clothes. Like, that's crazy. You'll only buy, you know, books or CDs back in the day, right? So I got into the industry through that initial work with AOL. And then from there, did a lot of different things. One of which was built my own business working with women all over Africa, bringing fair trade 
products to the U.S. and then reselling those products. And wow. I like to say I was about 15 years too early, a little ahead of the curve on a sort of fair trade, sustainable mm-hmm. businesses. But I learned a ton about what it's like for makers and importing and exporting and, you know, just the whole life cycle of getting a product made and then from point A to point B. I think we still need that. I mean, I think you just need to come back and do that still. Exactly. So, you know, but that experience between my experience at uh, working with AOL and then my experience working with these makers set me up really well when I saw this opportunity to join Etsy. Mm -hmm. And it was back then there was only about 50 people working at Etsy. It was really small. They were doing under a hundred million dollars of what's called gross merchandise value, sort of Mm -hmm. stuff sold on the platform. And they really wanted to go global. And, you know, I was like, well, I'm your gal. I live in New York. I've had experience doing global and I've got some experience with e-commerce. And so that's kind of how my journey got me, you know, to that space. And then, you know, from there, when new things popped up, like crowdfunding, I I got on that boat and then cannabis. That's amazing. So I would love to kind of maybe touch on Etsy for a bit and hear about, you know, what that looked like going global? Like, what was it like when you entered Etsy and where did you take it to? And yeah, just some of the details around that seem super fascinating. Yeah, sure. So, you know, the thing that's interesting about the internet is you can look at your stats and almost immediately you're like, we're global. You know, we've got people coming from all over the place. And, you know, so it's very tempting early on to say like, we're ready to go international, right? A lot of the learning is that because the internet is so global, it makes companies, I think, jump early, perhaps even earlier than they should. But I didn't know that then. Etsy didn't know that then. It was, it was very early days of all of this. So when I came in, I was like, all right, well, you know, we've got all these sellers who are living in other places, but most of the buyers at that time are still in the U.S., right? So it's global, but it's a little bit different because you're not having a full marketplace outside the US. Mm-hmm. You know, and a lot of the buyers don't even know that that product was made in France or the UK or Japan or whatever, right? They just see a cool product and they want to buy it. But we wanted to try to develop those outside markets and Etsy had a real first mover advantage in the US for like kind of digitizing the craft fair as you know, if yeah. you will, right? So the first thing you really understand is the way business works in other countries isn't necessarily the same as the U.S. And mm-hmm. the first thing I did, you know, everyone was like, hey, let's, let's go to Guatemala. Let's have sellers. And, and I was like, no, no, no. We're going to Canada. We're going to Australia. And we're going to yeah. the U.K. Because A, they speak English. B, they use credit cards. You know, C, culturally, the expectations for quality control and everything else are the same. Mm-hmm. And then from there we can start looking at other European countries where you've got language and and other things that might be different, but similarly expectations and whatnot. The other major challenge when you have a marketplace is payments, Yep. right? So the way somebody typically pays for something in Germany, France, and the UK are entirely different. And this was, you know, way before we had all these amazing payment companies that existed, you know, like this is, 10, 15 years ago, we didn't have those kinds of tools. So back then, you know, Germans use very little credit. They use effectively a debit card, right? It comes straight out of their bank, but they do that differently than we do it. They don't actually, you know, do it the same way. The French at that time were still writing checks, you know, I mean, they, they weren't using credit either. And then in the UK, they were using credit sort of the way we normally uh, think of it. And the systems were different, right? So carte bleu was the French credit card. Like we didn't have a way to process that Mm -hmm. in the US. So those kinds of issues came up very early. Like, are we really going to invest in the payment platform, let alone the, you know, language and converting euros to dollars and, you know, all those different tax pieces and all that kind of stuff. So that stuff spirals up real quick. And I think when you're a small company, you've got to understand like, is it worth it for us to take part of our engineering and product development team and put it toward that problem today? Or are we really going to just allow sellers who are willing to jump through their own hoops to be on essentially a U.S. platform? Mm -hmm. 
and then cultivate that and come back to international later. So those were some of the challenges we had to think through. And then that learning really helped me when I go on, you know, went to yeah. my next places. Yeah. I mean, I think that's such a good lesson just overall, because it can be so easy to see, you know, the shiny thing of like, of course, I want to like be in Vietnam and get all the products there and serve this tribe here and, you know, buy their goods. Exactly. And it's easy to kind of like want to jump on that instead of being like, wait, let's do the maybe more, you know, risk-free, semi-boring things of like do more of what we're already doing, you know, a good job at, and then expand afterwards and bring people to you if you can, while building up a stellar platform. Yep, exactly. And I, you know, I, I kind of put together this thing in my mind, I called it BEST, B-E-S-T. And the B and the E were sort of at a macro level, is a country easy to do business in? Is, is there an entrepreneurial mindset? Is there access to credit, like mm -hmm. at a big business level? And then economically, is there a strong GDP? Like do people spend money? Is there access to regular services? If you're going into a very much a developing country, and you're expecting, you know, regular shipments and all of that, and then power is going out every other week, that's yep. a real problem, right? Mm -hmm. So you kind of have these two business and sort of economic pillars. And then, then you have the other side, which is sort of the social and technical pillars. So that's the S and the T. Like socially, is it very, you know, trusted and common and high risk tolerance and a global mentality and you know, a trust in the markets and people are just very fluid with shopping online and that kind of thing. And then mm -hmm. finally, it's just the basics of like, do the payment systems integrate? Are the platforms open? Is there social media access? You know, all those kinds of things. So you really have to look at sort of those big macroeconomic things, as well as the cultural things to figure out if you're going to the right places for your products and services. Yep. Yeah, completely agree. So, I mean, the one thing I keep thinking about too, I'm now that we're talking about payments and how to explore different countries. And I feel like you've kind of been ahead with, you know, seeing certain industries and, you know, I think being way ahead of your time and introducing things probably before it's even like, you know, has the technology there to be able to support it. But I keep thinking about crypto and how, you know, right now we're still kind of worrying about payments and there are a lot of payment companies, but it's still tricky of like converting things. Um, and I kind of think of this world where you don't even know what's happening behind the scenes. Like everyone's going to be transacting. It's all going to kind of be like a similar currency. And all of that's going to go away when it comes to converting different currencies and what plugs into what, like things will just work in the future. And the underlying tech behind it or whatever crypto is behind it doesn't really matter to the average consumer, even if it's maybe not just payments, but also like smart contracts and stuff too. Like same thing, like it just works. What are your thoughts on uh, that today? A hundred percent. I couldn't agree more. I mean, the analogy I like to use is everyone watches TV, zero people know how a television works. Yeah. Like right? they knew like in the they're... early days, or they might've right? known like how their computer works in the early days or storage and all that. But then it's like, you kind you of just take it for use granted. It. Yeah. You yeah. just use it. And I think crypto, I think is really interesting. And I think more interesting is blockchain, the technology yeah. in general, yeah. right? The backbones of this. It needs to be figured out so that you can, you know, if you happen to have Ether and you want to use it, it's a simple conversion that you don't really think about just the way like you, you have your phone and you hold it up over a terminal and somehow magically your credit yeah. card pays for something, right? Yeah. It needs to be at that level of simplicity so that people don't think about it. And, and I think the, the key benefit of blockchain and crypto setting aside, of course, the, the, the security and, and traceability is just removing costly friction. It makes me bananas that it takes three days to send a wire transfer and they charge oh, me yeah. $25 on one end and $15 on the other end. And I'm like, guys, I sent the email in, in a millisecond. Why can't I send my money? And why are you charging me $25? And you know, it has so much to do with the security of is this mm -hmm. one transaction? Is it going from bank A to bank B? With blockchain, all that goes away and, and, and you know, you don't have to pay those crazy fees, which, you know, you look at the developing world, the amount of money that goes to kind of a Western union on, oh on gosh, transfers yes. and payments. I mean, it's outrageous, right? I mean, yeah. no, no offense my aunt to Western Michael union, asked me, but, you know. Well, kind of, <laughs> they should be very scared, I would think. I mean, oh, I, I absolutely. Have a, yeah. Yeah, like they're definitely going to be gone in a couple of years. I use them, my aunt and uncle are in Germany and they're like, oh, we sent you money via Western Union. I was like, 
what? What, what is that? Yeah. What do I do with it? Like, and then they're like, yeah, I think you just go to a grocery store, like Safeway. I'm like, what? And I saw the fee and it was a whole thing. I'm like, wow, how are you all still even around? Like, can you guys just send me Bitcoin? And right. Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> I'll be good. So how, how should companies be preparing for that then? If that is kind of, you know, because right now so many companies, I see them either investing in their own payment technologies, figuring out all the logistics for that, or investing in other people's technology, of course, and onboarding with that. But to me, it all feels a little bit short-sighted if knowing that like the world could be very different in just a couple of years and, you know, it's not going to be this much friction. I mean, I think most companies, I mean, Etsy was in a really unique situation in that it was a marketplace and very few payment options existed for a marketplace. You basically had like PayPal and eventually Amazon Payments, which was domestic only for a long time, mm -hmm. right? And so Etsy made the decision to build a payments platform. I would not suggest for most companies that that is a route to go. And yep. blockchain and crypto on top of that, I think Visa and MasterCard and companies that are trying to dethrone Visa and MasterCard, use their rails, bring in crypto be able to mm -hmm. kind of use their backbone, but not really pay all the Visa and MasterCard fees. I think those are the companies that are going to solve this problem. And most companies that are doing e-commerce, whether they're selling, you know, soil or t-shirts or, or, you know, Elon and his cars, like ultimately they're going to have a third party that's figuring out the back end of that to make it easy for consumers. Those problems just like dial up was a disaster. And now, mm -hmm. you know, we're doing a, a live Zoom with streaming video, no problem, right? So, yep. you know, those problems will get solved. And I wouldn't, especially for smaller companies, I would just let the process happen and then just integrate it when it's easy for consumers. And in mm -hmm. the meantime, most people are going to use a credit card and be fine with it. Yeah, yeah, I love that. Yeah, it's easy to kind of forget, you know, how many technological problems have been solved and how many times people thought like, uh, we'll never be able to figure this out. Like, we'll never be able to figure out dial up. We'll never be able to figure out, you know, cars. Like, horses are the way that we're going right, to be traveling. Right. I mean, so I feel like it's such a short term uh, mindset right now. And people are like, we won't be able to figure out the energy usage of mining, you know, Bitcoin or whatever it may be. And it's like, well, we figured out a lot of other things. So yep. I'm pretty bullish on America and, you know, people in general figuring it out. Well, you know, it's so interesting you say cars and horses because, you know, I'm working in the cannabis industry and hemp. Like the cannabis plant is the same thing, you know, hemp and cannabis, it's all the same plant. Obviously, it's grown in different ways for different purposes. But back in like, you know, the 20s, when, when Henry Ford was making a car, he made a car out of hemp, right? Yep. Like it's as strong as steel. And here we are now, 100 years later, figuring out that, you know what? Hemp could be an amazing product that is a carbon sequester. It's super strong. It's, you know, it helps regenerate the soil. There's so many great things about it. So sometimes mm -hmm. we make innovation moving forward and sometimes we come absolutely full yeah. circle and now have the additional technologies to make it, you know, scalable or whatever it is. So yep. I, I just think it's a really interesting um, dichotomy. Yeah. Well, let's jump into Good Earth Organics. Like, tell me a bit about what it is and what drew you to this company. Yeah, sure. So in a nutshell, we make soil. And so I didn't know this. And a lot of people probably don't realize that, like, when you go down to a store and you buy a bag of potting soil, there's no dirt in it. It doesn't come from, like, someone's backyard or, you know, no one dug that up and put it in a bag, right? So I actually I, always wondered where yeah, it came from. where does it come from, right? Is there a giant place where we're taking all the dirt? So soil is made from organic materials, right? It's like made from compost and it's made from peat moss and it's made from perlite or pumice or other, you know, natural and organic elements that you mix together that, you know, in our case, Good Earth, Good Earth Organics, we do all natural, 100% certified organic inputs. So when you put a plant in the ground, it gets its food, you know, from what's ever in the soil. So a lot of the earth soil today, because of, you know, farming practices, pollution, just people stomping on the ground, you know, all over the world, that soil doesn't have the nutrients that it used to have in it. It's compacted. Yeah. It's got toxins in it, you know. So if you want to grow really super healthy plants, you've got to put it in really solid soil. And of course, it needs, you know, air and water and sunshine. 
but the food comes from the ground. And mm-hmm. so we make premium organic soil that is optimized to grow cannabis. So it will have the right combination of nitrogen and phosphorus and potassium and other, you know, a bunch of microorganisms and whatnot that will feed this plant and have it grow in a natural, organic and rich way. And the company is based in an area in Southern Oregon. I like to call it sort of the Napa Valley of weed, right? Uh Because (laughs) it's it's called the Emerald Triangle and it's Southern Oregon and Northern California. And some of the best outdoor cannabis is grown in this part of the country because mm-hmm. of the weather and the terroir and the, you know, the rainfall and all the things that mix together. But even here, people need to use actual not from the ground soil. Some of it, the terroir, you can grow, but they add this living soil. It's got living organisms in it. And if you think about you know, what you eat every day, like if you eat super healthy, wonderful food, you feel great. If you eat a ton of junk food, you don't necessarily feel so good. And it's the same for the plant. Like if they're pulling a bunch of toxins out of the ground, it doesn't grow. And whatever's in that plant is what goes into you, right? Mm -hmm. So if that plant pulls a bunch of toxins and heavy metals out of the ground, and then you smoke it or vape it or, you know, consume it in a beverage or whatever it is, that's going into your body. So Mm -hmm. for us, it's all about a super clean, healthy soil really good for the plant. It's not, it's going to be also good for you as a person. And it helps regenerate that existing soil that's not in great shape now. Mm -hmm. So that's a little bit of a long answer to your question, but that's what we do. I have so many questions now (laughs) because this whole world, I mean, I have heard for a long time that, you know, the soil that we have today, like is not what it used to be. And that we used to be, you know, like kids would be out playing in the dirt and they'd be getting good organisms from that. And like, they would be getting exposed to things that just they're not today. And it makes me start to think about everything we eat now and everything we do. Like, is there certain regulations that kind of make sure that, you know, if something says it's organic, then that means it's growing in a type of soil and it's been tested for toxins. Like, what does the landscape look like right now? Not just for growing cannabis in good soil, but overall. So there's a couple of different things. So at one level, the FDA, you know, the U.S. Food and Drugs Association is not regulating cannabis because cannabis is not federally legal, Mm -hmm. right? So there are other groups. So we've got um, two certifications on our soil, OMRI and Clean Green. And these two organizations really look at the inputs, what's going into that soil. Each state, state by state by state, because again, cannabis is not federally legal, technically, legally, you cannot cross a state line with cannabis. So if you grow it in Oregon, you have to sell it in Oregon, Mm -hmm. right? And every state has its own level of testing and their own specific requirements. So Oregon and California and Washington have very, very, very high requirements to ensure that there are no toxins, no heavy metals. So if, if you're a grower and your entire crop is hinging on did I pass this test? Mm -hmm. You want to be pretty sure that the inputs in your plant were great. So you don't fail those tests. Right. And other States, you know, especially where you're growing indoors, right. Most cannabis in the U S if you're growing it in these 36 legal States, most States don't have the environment of, of Oregon, Washington, California. So it's grown inside. Mm -hmm. And even in Oregon, a lot of it's grown inside, except for this kind of area of Southern Oregon. They're growing their plants in soil, but they're feeding it, you know, hydroponically and whatnot. And they're very, very careful about what those nutrients are in order to pass those state tests. So if you see OMRI or CDFA, which is California's certification on inputs, like if you're a home grower, you know, okay, nothing going into my plant is going to be bad for me. It's all going to be natural and organic, which is great. Yep. Okay, cool. And then like, so why with this amazing dirt, why stop at cannabis? Like why not start expanding into like, now we're doing produce, now we're doing, you know, sure, whatever no, it's, it may be. It's, a, it's a great question. And the, the, the short answer is you could absolutely grow your tomatoes in this soil and it will uh-huh. be amazing, right? The and best tomato I've ever had. Best tomato I've ever had. And you know, most of our cannabis growers, you know, some of them have huge farms, they also have amazing vegetable gardens and, you know, they grow all their own things because yeah. they're amazing growers. 
And if you go to goodearthorganics.com, there's a woman on there named Joy, and she came in with these radishes that are like the size of softballs, you know, and she grew them in, in our um, guy's gift soil. And she's like, they're amazing. They're juicy. They're huge. They're incredible. So people do use our soil for things other than cannabis, but cannabis is a massively growing industry, right? Mm -hmm. It was about $20 billion in sales uh, this past year, 2020. It's going to 40 billion. So it's doubling in the next few years. And cannabis on the East Coast sells for $4,000 a wholesale pound. On the West Coast, it might be $1,000 a pound, right? Yeah. So our soil, we're optimizing for people that are growing things for $1,000 to $4,000 a pound. Yeah. Even heirloom tomatoes don't cost that much, even <laughs> at the most expensive organic yeah. grocer, right? So it's just a huge market to go after. And because of our 12 years or 13 years of experience working with growers and really optimizing for cannabis, we want to take that heritage and experience and target it in an industry that's booming mm -hmm. and that can sort of absorb a higher cost soil. You know, if you go down and, and buy a bag of our soil, it's not going to be the least expensive one on the shelf, right? Yeah. It, just like, you know, organic food or organic strawberries cost more than conventional ones, right? You know, we, we want to be in this growing market and we also want to use all this experience that we have from, these, from this learning when we go into new markets. Like we've just entered Oklahoma and you have 6,000 growers there and they're yeah. all pretty new to growing cannabis, right? And so we can come in and say, well, we've got, you know, 12 years experience from Oregon. Let us help you think through what might be the right products, soils, nutrients, whatnot to grow your cannabis. Yeah. So what does the partnership with the farmers look like? So basically, you know, bigger farmers, growers, cultivators, they come to us and they say, hey, you know, this is our planting season. This is how much soil we need. Some of them ask us to create, you know, small changes based on things that they're doing. But for the most part, we've got these three core soils that we make. One of them is sort of a fully loaded. It's got all the nutrients in it. It's got everything you want. Another one is we call it inert. It doesn't have any living nutrients in it. It's just a really great base. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I explain to people like if you've got a, a sponge and you've got dish soap, right? You can use that sponge more time. You know, you, you put the soap in it, you wash your dishes, the soap eventually runs out, but the sponge is still there. Mm -hmm. And that base of the soil is kind of like the sponge. And then you add the nutrients in as needed. People who are growing indoors, they have very specific regimen of how they're feeding their plants, but they want really a nice, healthy thing for the roots to hold on to and mm -hmm. for the drainage to be just right. And then they can add the food as they need it, but keep using the base and then, you know, replace the base in the next growing season. Mm -hmm. How do you think about like new markets? I mean, I can see, you know, you being very strategic about that, just like you were with Etsy. So how do you choose a place to go? And then how do you even you know, get on the radar of these farmers and acquire new customers? Yeah, so it's a great question. You know, part of it, being in Southern Oregon and, and being around, you know, since 2008, people know us here, right? So they, they know of us and they come to us. But we, we started looking, you know, I live in New York, right? And New York just finally legalized cannabis. And we have a not legal $4 billion market already, right? So this yeah. is just a huge opportunity. So being in the East and, and looking at already what's been going on in the West, you can see where major opportunities are happening. So mm -hmm. I mentioned Oklahoma. Oklahoma is a medical only state and they have more dispensaries per capita than any other state other than Oregon. And they have 6,000 growers. Now, some of these growers grow two two plants and some of these mm -hmm. growers grow 2000 acres you know it's a yeah. it's a wide range but when you when you look at these new markets that are just literally exploding like flowers right like just blooming overnight mm -hmm. you can see that they don't have the knowledge of more sophisticated markets and it's such a great opportunity to say hey we know we've got products that'll serve that market and that there aren't a lot of other companies yet in that market so Oklahoma was one place. Another place might be Michigan or Illinois, right? Those are relatively new cannabis markets with 
massive amounts of people. We're looking at those kinds of markets. And of course, ultimately New York. Now, right now, New York only has 10 licensed growers, right? They're all these big, big company, uh, big multi-state operators. Over time, as we see, you know, how many licensed growers are going to be in these other areas with big populations, we could kind of map out where we want to go. Yep. It also seems like you would have maybe two different types of farmers that you would need to reach. I mean, there's the entrepreneurial, you know, person who's just like, I want to get into this industry, never farmed before, but I know there's an opportunity. And they're probably, you know, very savvy when it comes to, you know, like their digital savviness or okay with going online, trying something, you know, maybe if they see an ad from you, they're like, yep, sure, I'll give it a try. And then you have this whole other segment of customers that, you know, it's probably just a part of their farming strategy where they're like, oh, I've done, you know, all the other parts to it before. I always just go to my, you know, retail location. I pick up the soil I need, or I have a big truck delivery of it. And they're not really accustomed to, you know, going online and maybe having orders coming in, in a, yeah, through e-commerce. So how do you approach these different types of customers. Yeah, you're totally right. So we think of ourselves as direct to grower. So yeah. instead of, you know, DTC, we're sort of DTG. And the first group you mentioned, I kind of put them in the home grower category, right? There's, um, you know, with the pandemic last year, tons of people, particularly young people were like, I'm going to start gardening. I'm going to start yep. growing things. And, and now there are over 20 states that allow home grow. Right. Mm -hmm. And so those people, you're absolutely right. They're going online. They're seeing good earth organic soil on our website, on Amazon, on walmart.com. And they're reading like, wow, this looks like great soil. It's healthy. It's going to be good for my plants. They could come on our website and, and you know, a, attend a webinar about growing, you know, things like that. I was like going to say a little tutorial, how to grow weed 101. <laughs> exactly. Right. But then there's the large cultivator. Mm -hmm. Right. And those people are going through, you know, an independent garden center or a hydroponic store, and they're coming in there for all their needs. They're, mm -hmm. you know, they're buying soil, they're buying lights if they grow indoors, they're buying nutrients, you know, all these things. It's really like a commercial endeavor. And so with that market, we are partnering up with the distributors that sell to those guys and doing education at that level, right? So that people understand why good earth organic soil and nutrients are valuable to these growers. Um, and that's kind of what we're doing in Oklahoma is partnering with some of the local distributors there. Um, so we see that direct to grower conversation at a different level than the one for the home grower. So when I'm thinking about, you know, a traditional grower going in and kind of seeing, you know, the products that are there, I mean, even from my perspective, I'll go to a Home Depot and I'll, you know, I need some soil. Okay, we've got Miracle Grow and this one. Oh, this one has a nicer name. Sounds like a miracle. It's going to turn my plant into a big plant. This one seems like it's not. And I just pick one based off packaging. Obviously, I'm not as knowledgeable as, you know, a farmer. But how do you really make sure that your product stands out and it really showcases all the benefits? without, you know, being there? Or maybe you guys are there. It's absolutely a great question. It's not easy is the answer. For us, the, our name, Good Earth Organics, with the giant organic on the front, that helps. And we have our certifications right on the bag. If you look at some soil that's synthetically made and, and you flip over and you start reading the back and there's giant like warning, keep away mm -hmm. from children, etc. It yeah. kind of gives you the idea that, Maybe, you know, maybe this is great to grow my lawn really quickly. Maybe it's not something I want to be eating after I grow it, right? Now, of course, yeah. it's not, you know, it's not going to, these are obviously tested and, and no one's going to get sick or, or whatnot. But if you go to the grocery store and you see the whole organic section and you mm -hmm. see the not organic section, you can choose, right? And, and, and especially items that like, you know, I know the berries, right? They're sprayed and it's right on the yeah. berry. It's different with an orange or a banana where you're peeling off the outer skin, right? So some people mm -hmm. might decide I'm going to spend a fortune for those raspberries, but I'm going to buy the conventional bananas, right? And so I think with soil, people are starting to understand like learning that like what's in the ground goes in the plant, right? And it's up to mm -hmm. us to provide more of that education through podcasts, through advertising, and hopefully as consumers really start to think about everything that goes into their bodies. 
And, you know, again, the pandemic, it's kind of like, what is a pandemic? It's a virus that, you know, was transmitted from person to person that, you know, came about probably because we've done a lot of damage to our planet, right? And there's a lot of mm-hmm. pollution and chemicals. And, you know, I think people are getting that into their heads to think more about what goes into their bodies. Yeah. It also seems like now's the time when consumers for a while we're focused on like bigger is better. So like, like I was mentioning around, like looking at the soil and being like, this one will get you the biggest plant or this one will, you know, go to the grocery store. Oh, I want the bigger one. And now starting to really think about, okay, what's in that where it's being grown? Like maybe I'm actually okay with these smaller raspberries that might, you know, become bad in two days, but knowing that they're organic yep. versus the one that looks beautiful and sits around for two weeks and is still okay. Like, I think now's the time when people are starting to question a lot about how they eat and consume things and where it's grown. But to your point, like education is key. And I think there's still a lot of room there because yeah, now I'm just wondering about all, like anything I'm eating, what kind of soil is it grown in? I don't know. And what are the regulations here in Texas? Probably not much. I don't know. Right, <laughs> but, right. Well, you know, the yeah. other thing is testing. You know, we have great anecdotal evidence and we grow our own plants at the company and compare those to others. But now we're doing very detailed third-party testing. So we can Mm -hmm. say, hey, if you use our soil versus these other soils, this is how your plant is going to grow. This is how much terpenes is available in this plant. And terpenes Mm -hmm. is what gives flavor and aroma, you know, whether it's an orange or a cannabis plant, right? It's going to tell you how much production is in each leaf, et cetera. So we're doing those tests now so that we can say to people, hey, this is not only certified organic, but you're going to get more from the plant. And maybe it is going to be growing not just faster, but much thicker stock, much bigger leaves, all of those things. Like it's not about how fast it grows. Yes, you want it to not be slow, but how much do you get out of it? What is the yield at the end of the day? And so through these studies that we're doing now, we'll be able to actually prove what we've known sort of anecdotally and just from Mm -hmm. our own personal experience in-house kind of growing our stuff against other products. And that'll really also be part of the marketing is like, you know, hey, if we can say you get X percent more terpenes in each cannabis plant, people are going to be pretty excited about that. Or this much THC is in this plant versus this other plant. People are going to be pretty excited about that. So what channels are you most excited about right now when it comes to your marketing efforts? Are there any ones that you're bullish on or that you're testing that other people maybe are sleeping on? This last year, you know, was really interesting. Cannabis is not a federally legal product, but it became an essential item overnight with, the, yeah. you know, it was like, wow, from illegal to essential. Um, and it exploded e-commerce in mm-hmm. this category, right? You know, in general, e-commerce, we saw massive growth, but I'm really excited about the home grow market and the opportunity to talk to people like yourself directly who are interested and want the education and want to learn more and probably not going to say you're not, that you don't care about price, but if you're growing four to six plants on your own and you want them to be great and you're going to spend, say, $100 on soil, you'd probably be willing to spend $150 on soil if you understood the value and the benefit that was going into that plant, right? Yeah. So to me... That's a really exciting market because it's brand new and home growers are going to get most of their information online from trusted sources. And because we've done this since 2008 with professional growers, hopefully people will consider us a trusted source. So I'm super excited about that channel. On the larger cultivators, those people do go to hydroponic stores and independent garden centers and whatnot. And the hydroponic stores are also moving very much online. You know, if you're buying two pallets of soil, right, that's very different than two bags of soil. Yeah. People also want to be able to get that kind of quantity delivered to them, right? And maybe they don't live that close to a store where they can pick it up or whatnot. So I do see opportunity in the, in the larger cultivator. People with massive farms, I mean, they're getting truckloads of soil. Yeah. They're not ordering it online. Like they're, they're going, you know, direct conversations. But I think the home grower and that sort of mid-sized person starting to, you know, maybe they're doing a 
a shipping container's worth of grow, right? Mm -hmm. They have a huge opportunity to talk to those people online and really help with the education and through the whole growing process, like soil is step one, but then, you know, you get to the vegetative state where it's all green and you add certain nutrients to feed the plant at that time. Mm -hmm. And then it starts to bloom, these beautiful flowers, and you give it different nutrients to help with the terpene production and the blooming. And then it gets all crystallized and sugary. There's a third set of nutrients that you add at that growing. So we Mm want to kind of help people through that entire cycle. Yep. I mean, I think I just need that 10-step process for any of my plants. (laughs) Because even just thinking about which ones do I trim back? Which ones don't I? Should I be watering it right now when it's dormant? Like Right. I mean, why don't we have this just for, you know, in general, when even having plants or making like having at home gardens, that whole world, I mean, feels like something I need to learn, but there's no easy spot to, you know, find good education. And then, yeah, growing cannabis is a whole different level, like you said. Mm -hmm. Interesting. I mean, do you see the um, more like the large farmers who are used to, you know, having the conversations and going to their person? It seems like in like one to three years they're all going to be operating digitally too. And a lot of times kind of having that, you know, the average consumer operating in that market, being the home grower kind of also helps, you know, highlight the benefits of that to these, you know, bigger farmers who maybe aren't operating that model right now. Like, how do you see that transforming? Well, I think what we're going to see is lots more technology at the cultivator level. So, I mean, already there are these amazing, you know, startup companies that are, let you see like, okay, we have a slightly yellow leaf in the mm-hmm. seventh bay of the fifth row in the third you know, level. Uh-huh. What's up with that plant, right? And, and it's like, oh, that plant got a little too much water. Like everything is becoming extremely technical when you're growing in mass volume and for huge production. So I think what you're going to see is you're going to see a, a separation in the industry of, you know, like we have craft beer today, right? We have these like mm-hmm. small batch, amazing craft brewery where the brewers kind of experimenting with things. And then you have huge mass market beer, right? Mm-hmm. And I think you'll see that in cannabis too. Like if you have a cannabis beverage and you're a Budweiser size company, right? Or your Constellation Brands, which has made early moves into the cannabis space, they might even do synthetic THC, that's mm-hmm. created exactly the same in a lab, very technology driven. The craft person is going to use technology in a different way, right? To make sure that every plant is perfectly healthy and whatnot. The companies that are more integrated with those people digitally, they will be doing, you know, but at the end of the day, like soil is one of those things, like you can't get it digitally, right? Like it's a yeah. physical thing you got to have. And so, whether they're placing their orders online or talking to their growers or whatnot, ultimately they still need to get this physical product. Um, But we will see huge inroads in technology in in running these companies and running these businesses, just like we've seen in every other industry. Yep. Yeah. Completely agree. So what are you most excited about with Good Earth Organics? Like what things are you doing right now that you're, you know, really bullish on? Where do you want to be in a couple of years? We've been here in in Southern Oregon and we've got this great reputation. We're well known, but I'm super excited just to take us to the whole US, right? And one of the things we're doing to do that is raising money. And because I spent a few years at Indiegogo doing crowdfunding, Mm -hmm. I wanted to be able to leverage that experience here at, at Good Earth Organics. And we're doing a crowdfunding campaign right now on a platform called Seed Invest. And the mm-hmm. thing that's great about this is an everyday average person can invest in Good Earth Organics today and kind of ride this wave with us for expansion. And, you know, sometimes with private companies, you have to be an accredited investor. You have to have a certain amount of capital, et cetera. Mm-hmm. With our opportunity, you do not have to be an accredited investor. The minimum investment is $1,000, which is pretty accessible for a lot of people. And the coolest thing about this is you're investing in the cannabis industry, but you're not, quote unquote, touching the plant. We sell a fully legal in every state, you know, of of the country product, soil and nutrients. But because we're going after this cannabis industry, it's a way to like invest, 
and everyone talks about picks and shovels, right? Like Levi's got started during the gold rush and all the bar owners and restaurant owners in California who were near the gold mine, they, they did great, whether or yeah. not people found gold. And so we, we think of ourselves in that same way, an ancillary to the business or to the industry. So it's an exciting time because we're raising this capital. We're going to go you know, national and all the things you're talking about, like how do you build the brand and how do people understand who you are and doing the testing? That's where we are right now. And, and my whole career has been come to companies when they've got you know, a vision, but they don't know exactly how they're going to get there. And it's a super yeah. exciting time to scale the company and capture these new opportunities. So I'm Amazing. super excited about that. And, and I love that we can open this to everyday regular people who mm-hmm. kind of want to jump on this train with us. So anyone who might be interested, you can find us on Seed Invest or from our website, goodearthorganics.com. I love that. I mean, it's it also so true to your roots of like what you've done, you know, so far in your life of like empowering, you know, people to be a part of that journey and trying to get artisans, you know, to be able to sell their products in the U.S. And it just seems so true to where you've been to be like, yeah, we're going to, you know, do a crowdfunding investment thesis where like everyone kind of can join along with us. That's really cool. I really do like when we can get, quote unquote, the little guy, the little gal on an equal playing field with with everyone yeah. else. And I think that's probably, you know, technology, one of the most important things that has happened with the result of, you know, building the internet and e-commerce and whatnot is, you know, almost anybody can put a website up and pretty inexpensively these days, right? And mm-hmm. if not for free and and be out there just like just like the bigger corporations. Yep. So the one big question I have is when do you think cannabis will be federally legalized. Well, if I, I do like that, close. if I do that, I just you know, make a bet. What are you thinking? I know you all have to talk about this. I know, you know, so we could get to 50 states mm-hmm. having it legal before it's federally legal. We're already at 36. Yeah. You know, practically every day I open my, you know, email newsletters and it's like another state has it on the ballot, right? Mm-hmm. So the way politics is today, and you know, trying to get Congress on one page and all of that, I think it's mm-hmm. easier for states to say, hey, you know what? The job creation and the tax base from this industry is amazing. Mm-hmm. We need to get on board. Like our yep. neighboring states are taking all of that from us right now. Like we, yeah. we need to get on board too. So I think we could see that. And I think we could see some legislation around banking and some of the other things that will allow capital to flow into the industry. And so if more states come on and then, you know, the Safe Banking Act passes or whatnot, at some point, federal legalization is going to be like, well, we might as well do it because all these states are legal. So there's been some hope that the banking might pass this year. And so we're all crossing our fingers on that. And I mean, Alabama has now got it on the state ballot. So you know, if you're seeing states in the deep red South thinking about yeah. cannabis, it's a really good sign. Yeah. And so even if all 50 states did, you know, legalize it, you still can't do the cross state transferring of cannabis, right? Which to me is like the biggest issue. I read an article a while back where maybe, and I might mix the states up, but there was like a huge surplus of cannabis, maybe in Nevada or something. And then California didn't have enough, like they had a lot of demand not enough cannabis to sell. And just the fact that like, they were kind of just like stuck in those two states where like some of this cannabis was about to just you go know, bad. Yeah. Go bad. Yeah. And to me, that's like the biggest issue is not being able to like, you know, logistically be able to send it around where the demand is and just having to predict accurately, like what will the people in the state need? And if you have a surplus, then sorry. Right. No, it's, it's, I mean, it is interesting, right? Cause I always say like, we don't grow oranges in Minnesota. But everyone has orange juice there, right? Yeah. You know, wine comes from Napa and, you know, things are are grown where it makes sense, you know, with the breadbasket of the U.S. and and whatnot. And I think cannabis will get there, right? Like interstate commerce is just what we do here, right? It's just the norm for every other agricultural product or pretty much any product. So that will change. And already some states, I think Oregon... California, Washington, maybe Nevada, the governors have already sort of pre-signed an interstate commerce bill 
if and when certain things happen legally, like if all of those states are legal, if all 50 states are legal and there's certain things that have happened, they'll be able to start doing that like on day one. So yep. there's a big push for that kind of thing. And economically, like, you know, back to the orange juice example that like, it doesn't really make sense to grow oranges in 50 states, right? Yeah. So I think we'll get there. Yeah. And I could see a big, well, I mean, you can tell me, but it seems like there'd be a big consolidation effort too. of people being like, wait, why am I growing something in Texas or something where it's very hard to do? Maybe I'm going to close up shop here and go, you know, where it's a little bit easier or think about an indoor method. And it seems like just by all that passing, there'll be a, another big shakeup coming. No doubt. Rethinking it. No doubt. And I think indoor, you know, indoor has the ability to control the environment, especially on a large scale, like almost pharmaceutical grade, you know, cannabis, like the beauty of outdoor sun grown and, you know, the flavor and the texture and, and whatnot can be really mm -hmm. unique. And, and it's going to be a little bit different from batch to batch, just like, you know, the 2016 Cabernet is not the same as the 2015 Cabernet, right? But there's also going to be a huge number of products, you know, whether it's gummies, like we everyone mm -hmm. thinks about now, or in the future, I think, you know, beverages is going to be an amazing thing, right? Mm -hmm. So instead of going out and having a, a beer or wine with friends, you you go out and you have a cannabis beverage, right? Mm -hmm. They're going to want the whatever whatever's in that beverage to be 100% exactly the same every time, right? Yep. So that you, you have a beer, you know how your body's going to react to that, and it, and it mm -hmm. needs to be the same. So things like that will probably be grown indoors. And it'll be more of a manufactured type item. So I think there will be different methods of growing for different purposes, no matter what. You know, so there'll be a lot of opportunity in different areas. Yeah, it'll be fun to watch. Yeah, All absolutely. Right, well, let's, let's shift over to the lightning round. The lightning round is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud. And this is where I ask a question and you have a minute or less to answer. Okay. Are you ready, Liz? Yes. All right. I'm secretly curious about what? Oh, wow. Um, I'm secretly curious about what other countries will legalize cannabis before the U.S. Mm, that's a good one. When you want to feel more joy, what do you do? I go outside 100%. I hike, I ski, I bike, I do something in nature. I love that. Tell me about a time when you made a powerful choice that you still think about powerful choice I still think about. You know, it's funny. I Throughout my career, I've always been like, I want to go learn this and I'll just, something good will happen from it, right? Yeah. And so that was the case in cannabis. I decided I'm just going to start going to conferences and learning. And now I'm working at a company that's 100% focused in this industry. That's great. What's something wise your elders taught you? Keep going. You know, don't give up. Um, I have two older brothers who are about 10 years older than I am. And I learned early that you have to learn how to play the game or learn how to throw the ball or you'll be the ball, right? And so just keep at it. Yep. I like that. If you were to have a podcast, what would it be about and who would your first guest be? What would it be about? It would be about all the exciting things that uh, women are doing to build businesses and, and, and companies. And I would try to bring a bunch of sort of younger generation folks and, and understand what their challenges are so we could mentor them and ensure that we have a lot of strong women leaders going forward. That'd be a good one. All right. And then the last one, what's up next on your reading list? Oof. You know, I have to say I'm a terrible reader um, in the sense that I, I love to read, but I, I spend too much time reading newsletters and, and, and things That's like okay. that. okay. That can count. I would really love to read just a good summer beach novel, you know, mindless, and I could just yep. flip the pages. All right, Liz. Well, this has been such a fun interview. Thank you for coming on and sharing your knowledge. And yeah, it's just been really interesting. Where can people hear more about you and Good Earth Organics? Great. Well, first of all, thanks so much for having me. It was, it was a pleasure to be here. You can find more about Good Earth Organics at goodearthorganics.com. You can learn more about investing at seedinvest.com slash goodearthorganics. And uh, since I've been in the internet space since the mid 90s, you can find me on all the socials pretty much. Liz Wald on LinkedIn and, and everything else. Amazing. Thanks so much. Thank you. Hey, 
listeners, thanks for tuning into this episode. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I did. If you haven't already, please subscribe, rate, and review this podcast. It helps spread the word and I would greatly appreciate it. See you next time. Up Next in Commerce is brought to you by Salesforce Commerce Cloud and created by the team at mission.org. Subscribe now at Apple Podcasts or wherever you listen to podcasts.